Hello and welcome everyone to the Alatia Foundation podcast. My name is Axel Threlfall. I'm editor at large, uh, Reuters based out of London. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Jihad Azur to the program. Uh, Dr. Azur is the director of the Middle East and Central Asia Department of the International Monetary Fund, where he oversees the organization's work in the Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, and uh, the Caucasus region. Uh, previously, he served as Lebanon's finance minister from 2005 to 2008. Uh, Dr. Azur, w- welcome uh, to the uh, Alatia Foundation podcast. Very nice to see you today. Thank you, actually. Thank you for having me. Um, look, I want to I want to start big picture macro. We've got a lot to talk about, but I want to start big picture uh, macro economic. Um, the IMF raised its global growth forecast for 2023 uh, recently. And a number of assumptions at the end of last year are being quite severely tested. Uh, re- re- recession in Europe, recession in the US, China growth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How, what? what Looking forward to 23, what might we see as the big context uh, under which all of the stuff operates now? 2023 is a year of transition uh, that carries um, hopes, but also a lot of uncertainties. Uh, Of course, compared to last year, where the global economy was subjected to severe shocks, uh, the first one is the war in Ukraine and the impact on the energy market. A problem of uh, risks related to food security, both in terms of access as well as also in terms of affordability. The whole issue of um, addressing the um, inflation, especially in advanced economy and the credibility of central banks. Last but not the least, um, China's strategy in terms of managing COVID with the zero COVID strategy that has affected the potential Uh, of the Chinese economy. Therefore, 2022 was a year uh, where these successive shocks required uh, some quick adjustment. Um, And we saw a certain number of measures taken in terms of um, tightening um, uh, monetary policy, which has led to increase in interest rates that negatively affected emerging economies. Um, Redirection of flows of energy in order to address the risk of shortages of energy for Europe, this which has also had uh, some important changes that we will see their results in the future in the energy market. Um, We saw also the signs of fragmentation uh, affecting um, the potential, I would say, uh, global coordination on economic policies. And also we saw that um, energy security, climate change, are the two sides of the same coin, and therefore a certain number of new issues have emerged. What does it mean for 2023? 2023 is a transition year. Uh, Of course, um, um, growth will drop compared to last year, uh, globally from 3.4 to 2.9. However, uh, expectation where um, at the end of last year, where I would say um, less positive or, or, or more negative. Mm-hmm. Therefore, um, uh, the situation is challenging, but I would say less challenging than uh, what we uh, saw it last year. A certain number of developments are helping. Um, uh, and uh, we're still in a situation where there are a certain number of risks that we need to address. Yeah. Can I can I can I jump in um, specifically on China? Are we are we getting ahead of ourselves um, to think that you know China now it's ended zero COVID is going to very quickly re-energize the global growth story? Are we getting ahead of ourselves to feel that? I would say this is one of the those uncertainties that we have to deal with this year. China and India. Uh, based on the projections, based on, I would say, the baseline of the projections, would be um, leading half of the global growth. Therefore, uh, here, uh, of course, there are certain number of risks and certain number of issues that we need to uh, follow. Risks, um, uh, to which extent um, this recovery is going to accelerate or no? Uh, What are the issues that uh, may surface? Uh, We knew last year that uh, the real estate market uh, was um, facing certain number of challenges um, in terms of um, um, asset adjustments. 
Um, we don't know to which extent export will accelerate and um, um, the demand for certain number of basic products and commodities in China. Uh, therefore, yes, of course, we have to be cognizant this year. Uncertainties are going to be high, which makes policies um, more important than ever. Uh, yeah. The um, ability to uh, assess, uh, adjust, and being agile in changing policy direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, look, I, I want to touch on a few uh, specific areas, parts of the world, and indeed some countries, given the the news cycle at the moment. Uh, I'm sitting in, in Qatar, uh, so 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 let's start locally in the Gulf region. You, you've said that oil rich. Middle East states could reap up to, I think it's $1.3, $1.4 trillion in, in additional uh, oil revenues over the next few years, gi given the, uh, the the current high energy prices. Uh, my question is this, how important is it for the Gulf states to invest this wisely in sectors that are going to allow them to reduce their dependence on oil? And do you believe, from what you've seen, do you believe they are in a position and are able to uh, to do that, to make those investments wisely. So let me take one step back, okay, and look at the, their economic performance over the last few years. What we saw that those countries were fast uh, when um, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, hit uh, their uh, their economy. Uh, they were fast in reacting in, uh, to protect lives and livelihoods. Uh, they have introduced certain number of reforms over time, over the last five, six years, uh, that uh, um, have accelerated the recovery of the non-oil sector. Therefore, we are in a, in a situation where uh, oil exporting economies, especially in the GCC, have took certain number of important measures to diversify their economies, diversify their source of revenues, and anchor their policies into the medium term. In terms of um, medium term um, reform agendas, as well as also now we see this more and more me medium term fiscal strategies. Those um, policy directions help those economies to withstand the shock of COVID and recover faster. Now the increase in oil price, the increase in export of oil has accelerated, uh, I would say this recovery and provided them with two important elements. One improved their external accounts, better balance of payment, and also because of their ability to reduce their budget deficit, increase their capacity to accumulate reserves. The, the, the question today is how those countries can use two levers, the resources and the reforms, hmm. in order to permanently accelerate the, the transformation and prepare them for what they have aspired to achieve, which is economies that are productive, uh, that are less dependent on oil, and the economies that can play a bigger role globally. Therefore, I think they need to use these two avenues uh, to accelerate their, their transformation. However, we always know that in previous cycles, risks were high in terms of, you know, um, responding pro-cyclically to some of the demand. Therefore, it's still very important to watch. We are in a situation where we did not see this trend happening, but it's always important to remain vigilant. I would add one element, um, Axel, here that also has changed. The relationship in terms of um, economic linkages between GCC and other countries has already uh, uh, changed or showing signs of transformation from financing to investment and uh, from um, state to state to more now the private sector to private sector type of capital flows. Do, do you, I guess it, I, I, I come back to this point though, whether you, from what you're seeing, do you believe that these countries, the GCC countries have the fiscal discipline to get this right? So we saw important reforms happening, uh, Axel, over the last few years uh, in terms of raising revenues, introducing new form of taxations, um, um, developing medium term uh, expenditure framework, uh, building capacity in terms of expenditure management, improve their capacity to implement large investment projects. However, we always 
have this temptation and this risk that um, needs to be addressed. Next week, we will be heading to the Gulf. We have our annual Arab Fiscal Forum where we meet um, with ministers of finance, central bank governors of the region. And this is one of the items that, uh, items that we are going to discuss. For the oil importing countries, emerging economies, how they can protect themselves from the emerging challenges. And for the oil exporting countries, how to maintain the discipline, accelerate the transformation, and you know, even lead in certain new sectors, technology, climate um, um, investment. All these elements are opportunities for those countries to lead uh, and accelerate the global transformation. Um, all right. L leaving uh, th that region aside, I mean, you're, you're, you have the, the, the countries in your region are, 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 are plentiful. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, fragile and conflict affected states uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I, I think the ones included in your remit must make up what a, I mean, a, a, a good third of the countries in, in, in the region here. Which which countries are you is the IMF? most worried about and, and we look at the context again inflation public debt rising spending needs where 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 are you where where do you see most reason for concern well this is an important question um yes we have concern one the level of growth that we saw last year was um very low uh, did not exceed one percent for those countries at the same time, they were still managing or dealing with um, uh, the COVID-19 issues. Um, and food security was one of the most challenged for those countries, not only in terms of accessibility, but also in terms of affordability. Um, last but not the least, climate issues hit uh, those countries. We saw floods and, and, and droughts in Sudan. We saw also in other countries, we last uh, or this week, we see in devastating earthquake affecting countries in the region. Therefore, those countries were growing at a very low speed, um, suffering from the weak infrastructure and capacity to respond to shocks. Um, they host a large number of internally displaced and refugees, and which increased their, their fragility. Um, difficulties of those countries are also aggravated by the fact that the political framework, the institutional capacity is very weak. Take the case of Yemen or the case of, uh, of Syria and, and other countries. Uh, in terms of um, uh, state infrastructure that you need in order to provide the basic health services, um, uh, channel resources to where resources are needed, those are key issues that those countries are facing. And we are calling both regional and international community to step up their support. We have provided the food window uh, in order to provide access to finance uh, for those who are facing um, a food security issue, but I think it's not enough. Yep. And this is issue that um, also needs to, put, to be put in a context that with the war in Ukraine, there is a risk of, um, I would say, a shift in focus from providing support to those countries to maybe uh, concentrate support um, to other parts of the world. And therefore, this is a plea. This is um, a message that also next week when we deal, when we meet with the decision makers, we are going to um, to highlight. Yeah, I, I know mean, also, and sorry yeah. on that, I know also that there are certain initiatives regionally. Uh, uh, last, week, uh, last year in November, we were in Saudi and we organized um, um, half a day conference on these issues and um, uh, GCC countries have put in place $9 billion of um, food security window to provide assistance to countries in the region. But this is good, but it's not enough. And so generally speaking, we you come back to that familiar refrain that there is not enough multilateral engagement uh, when it comes to regions uh, or uh, fragile and conflict aff uh, affected states is the ones we talk about. Yes. Uh, well, one has to recognize that it's difficult with, to work in those cases because you have security issues. Sometimes you have a difficulty to uh, engage with the authorities. I take the example of Afghanistan, a country that also recovered. Uh, we have uh, um, for years provided assistance to Afghanistan, but uh, since last year, 
um, we have um, uh, um, the impossibility to operate there, which has um, had an impact on our capacity to help ministries of finance, central bank, in order to deal with uh, the macroeconomic stability and provide assistance to those who need it. You mentioned the the, the devastating earthquake uh, to impact Turkey and, and Syria. Um, I know Turkey isn't part of your uh, portfolio, if you like, but but Syria is. How how do you imagine uh, this this tragedy will will change the the dealings you have currently with 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 the region? Well, first of all, this is a humanitarian tragedy that we right. all. Uh, feel sorry for for the people of of Syria as well as also the people of Turkey, um, uh, and this require um, a to provide humanitarian assistance to those who need it. Of course, uh, in this area, um, UN agencies and other type of um, non governmental and governmental institution are at the forefront. For uh, the IMF is more on the recovery, uh, on the reconstruction and economic stabilization. Therefore, our role here is, is minimal. But you, beyond this question, there are another question that is important. I think it, there is a need today in a region that has been affected by conflicts, by instability, to um, think of, of a framework, mm. how to address in a systematic, in a systemic way those issues, how to provide a new partnership in order to reduce those tensions, and also how to use a new framework of regional cooperation to reduce the risks of those kind of, uh, of uh, conflicts or those kinds of, um, of problems. Uh, I think it's, 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 um, it's an issue that we all uh, address partially but I believe we need a comprehensive and integrated strategy for that. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk to you as well about uh, Pakistan and the, uh, um, the the recovery efforts there following the the flooding last year. I, I've I've spoken a number of times recently with Sherry Rehman, the the, the climate minister. Um, let me ask, and of course, this is a country that's had many bailouts um, since since the 80s. How happy are you uh, with the progress being made there? I think there's discussion to revive a six and a half billion dollar loan program. How how I, I, how happy are you with the progress? Are you seeing signs of enough belt tightening in the future in light of an election coming up in August uh, from f f from the government? What What's the prognosis? Well, Three things. One, uh, uh, Pakistan faced one of the most challenging uh, humanitarian and uh, natural disaster uh, with what happened last year, which is another manifestation of um, the climate issues. This region is one of uh, those uh, parts of the world where the contribution may not be the largest in terms of carbon emission, but it's one of the most affected. Mm -hmm. uh, and we recently did a study that showed that over the last three decades, there are uh, gradual but consistent deterioration of economic performance, of inclusion, um, of um, social protection because of that. And it's time to address this issue. And the two ways we see uh, as priority, one is mitigation and the other one is adaptation, especially adaptation for countries who, who need uh, support who cannot have access to those and therefore we call for uh, a new financial approach to climate uh, to climate transition. Uh, Pakistan is a country that the fund has been constantly supportive. We have provided um, several uh, uh, programs and financing. Uh, we have provided flexibility during COVID and after COVID, but there are a certain number of important reforms that are needed to stabilize the macroeconomy because without Stabilizing the macroeconomy, inflation will remain high. Uncertainty also will remain high in terms of capital flows. And it's very important to, uh, to address some of those issues. Look, economic stability is the best gate to prosperity. Without stability, it's very, very challenging to have a sustainable um, uh, prosperity in any country. Um, uh, Pakistan is the country where the uh, uh, huge talent and resources. 
Um, of course, now with um, uh, the um, uh, crisis last year, the um, conference that happened in Switzerland, where we uh, participated, it's an uh, it's an opportunity to channel additional support um, for humanitarian and reconstruction issues. But still, I think there's some additional effort to be made in order to stabilize the economy, reduce fiscal risks, and also provide them. Um, 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 and level the playing field for the private sector. Hmm. With the, I mean, you touched on this briefly, but the the, the loss and damage, uh, I don't know what we, we what we would call it, a, a arrangement, um, loose arrangement that came out of COP twenty seven. Um, is it something we should be optimistic about? Is it something we should? Uh, be wary of in, in 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 the sense that unless we see momentum here, um, this process won't move forward. Well, look, COP twenty seven was the moment where this um, uh, new initiative has been launched. Uh, we need to give it some time to see um, to which extent is going to um, uh, to catalyze support. Uh, beyond this um, initiative, there is an important question is how are we going to finance all uh, what we need in terms of investment and in technology and transformation and adaptation, especially for countries who may not have the resources for that. We at the fund, we have designed a new instrument which is called um, a resilient and sustainability trust that is dedicated to that. But this, this is an, an important initiative in order to help countries um, address some of the structural issues uh, to attract additional investment. But uh, the only way for those countries, especially uh, emerging economies, low income countries, is to get more investment. Um, and this is where uh, our effort is going to be focused this year. Our participation in the COP28 will focus on these three elements. And um, um, uh, climate finance is something that um, um, we as an international community, public and private and multinationals, multilaterals, need to put our minds together in order to find a strategy and um, provide what we collectively need, the, the trillions we need for, for this to happen. Is, uh, are, are, the, are, the, are those organizations like the IMF, like the World Bank, are they proactive enough when it comes to their roles in combating uh, the effects of, of climate change and helping on the financing side? It's very difficult to judge ourselves, but I can tell you a bit how the fund has moved. Clearly, climate is at the peripheral of our mandate, but uh, we recognize more and more that climate is macro critical. And for that purpose, we have you know, um, invested in, in building our capacity to ad assess those issues. Uh, we developed new financing instruments for that, and we want to use our convening role. We want to use our mandate, uh, our global mandate serving 200 countries in order to accelerate this agenda. Um, at the level of the region, we have already uh, including this in our surveillance, in our what we call our Article 4. We are now uh, um, uh, at the verge of preparing a few programs uh, related to climate issues. But I think the most important one from where we sit and our ability to bring together people with different objectives and in certain cases compl conflicting objectives to agree on a certain number of key principles where we as an international community, we need to put in common uh, otherwise, we will not be credible. Of course, we recognize that um, uh, risks of fragmentation are high, and we recognize that those risks also could affect the ability of the global community to address um, some of those strategic issues. But um, it's an important moment. It's a turning point that we want uh, both um, uh, those who have the means, advanced economies, um, to accelerate uh, their transition and reduce uh, their carbon emissions, but also we want to provide assistance to those who don't have the resources to be able to mitigate 
um, to reduce the impact of um, climate risks on their economy, on their societies, and also uh, not have climate become another element where um, inclusion is um, uh, is being slowed down. Yeah, uh, Dr. Azor, uh, we have run out of time. Um, I want to uh, stop us there. Many, many thanks uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts with us in this uh, podcast. Uh, it's been uh, uh, a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, thank you all for listening. Uh, be sure to keep up to date with all of the Alatia Foundation's work uh, by following them on Twitter and YouTube. I'm Axel Threlfall for Reuters. Many thanks for listening. 